Now, we have touched on before the priority of a lien, the priority of these liens. And that is something I want to touch on once again, just so that we make sure we've now seen it twice and we kind of understand it. Remember, liens get recorded by date, okay? So first lien in from Fifth Third Bank for $100,000 got recorded on this date. It is first lien. The second lien from Nat City was a home equity line of credit, and it got recorded on this date. Notice it was second one in. So liens get paid off by priority. And in this case, the priority equals the date. So the first money goes to the first lien. If there's money left over, which there better be, the second money goes to the second lien because it was the second one left. If there's any money left over, that goes to the homeowner as the profit in the sale. And we talked about that first one in gets paid first. Now, there is a situation where they could flip dates because of a refinance. This one comes in on January the 1st of twenty. 23, but remember the word subordination agreement? In this particular case, this is going to still be number one because they flipped priorities even though it's a junior date. That's going to allow the priorities to be realigned even though the date is after this one here. So they get recorded by the date and they get paid off by their priority. And the priority is almost always equal to the date unless there's some kind of subordination agreement. Now, I want to show you one other thing that we didn't talk about in the other Let's get rid of this word just so we can see this. Actually, let's go back this way. So we can see the original one. <clears throat> so let's go back to the first. First one in, fifth third, gets first money. Now, let's say I fail to pay my real estate taxes. Real estate taxes. For 10 grand. Well, they're going to record that. Let's make this uh, 4-1 of 2022. Notice it came in after the second because of the date. Do you honestly think that the real estate taxes are going to come in in third position? Think about that. The answer is they most certainly are not. And here's how they get to be number one. You all in your head say, well, they're going to be first. Well, of course they are. But you talk about bullying. Watch this. This is how the real estate taxes get to be number one. Ta-da! They're number one. They got rid of all of the other liens. They just said bye. And now real estate taxes are number one. Now you should understand why the, why the lender wants to escrow your taxes. Because in this example, both fifth, third, and Nat City just lost their lien against that property. They're out the money because they gave the money to the guy or family to buy the house. 
and now they don't have a lien any longer because the taxes erased them. So now you should dawn on you why a, why a lender wants to make sure that they escrow your taxes for you every month as part of your house payment. And when the taxes come due and you go, hey, dude, I don't really have, you know, $1,200. The lender does not want this scenario to happen. So they go, oh, well, don't worry. For the last 12 months, we have been collecting $100 of your house payment and we will pay your taxes for you to ensure this scenario on the screen doesn't happen. Do you think they're doing this because they like you? No, they are doing it to protect this scenario from a tax lien removing all of the previous liens to make it number one. It doesn't just jump to the top. It completely gets rid of everything else. All right. So those tax liens are actually <clears throat> take priority over the other liens. And they do that by erasing them completely. That's why they escrow. All right. So let's talk about tax liens. Okay. Tax liens in general are called an ad valerum tax. An ad valerum. Ad valerum is a Latin word that means at value. All right. So do not get confused. It is not an equitable lien because I told you that's based on some value. This is a state law. Makes it a statutory lien. Makes it a statutory involuntary specific lien. It just so happens that the law says it's based on a value. That's why it's called an ad valerum. All right. So it's a statutory law that puts this taxes in place and taxes can be levied by about anybody. There's state taxes and county taxes and city taxes. There could be a school tax if you live in a certain district. There could be environmental taxes like drainage. You might have a library tax. You may have hospital taxes if you need a new hospital. There could be sanitary. There could be new road taxes. So anybody can levy the tax against an entity if they go through the proper channels. So we're not going to go through that process. I mean, um, I know that in one of the counties I used to live in when my children were going to school, we had a county, a school tax that we voted on in our uh, township because they wanted to hire some new teachers that were bilingual in the English and Burmese language. So we self-imposed another tax in our township and added it to, we went through the process of the referendum. We voted on it, did all the right stuff. And that added another school tax and they are levied according to the property value. It is ad valerum. And uh, like I said, it is specific, meaning it's only attached to that one property. It's involuntary because the taxing authority has done it to you. And it's statutory in nature because it's a law. Even though that law says value. All right. There are people that could be exempt from paying taxes. Government entities like buildings or federal buildings, religious organizations, institutions of higher learning like University of Miami or Indiana University or uh, SoCal, Southern California. All of those can be exempted from that. Here's a key. Anybody can be exempted if you can go through the right channels and prove it. A lot of cities that have sports stadiums may be exempted. 
because they have gone through the process and said, hey, look, you guys want this stadium here because we're going to bring in people that spend the night and buy lunch and dinner and beer and alcohol and visit here and visit there. So it's a benefit. So anybody can ask if you go through the process. Now, how you calculate this ad volarum tax is a process that is actually mathematically very simple. And there are three parts to calculating the ad valerum tax. There is this new value that we are going to talk about that we've never talked about. It is called <clears throat> the assessed value. The assessed value is the value that your jurisdiction has determined that that property is worth. <clears throat> it is not <clears throat> the appraised value. It's not the sales price. It's not the loan amount. It's not what you want it to be worth. It's not what Santa Claus said it was worth. It is what the jurisdiction said the property was worth. On the good side for this exam, you guys cannot calculate this number. It will be given to you in the exam. It will say something like the assessed value of. Now, this test, another hint, is going to be loaded with some confusion factors. So it's going to say something like, a house that was appraised at 250,000 and you borrowed 200,000 on it, but it was assessed at 180, what are the taxes? Make sure you understand that for taxes, you only use that assessed value. It threw in a bunch of other numbers like the purchase price was 250, the loan amount was 225, the assessed was 180. These two are just confusion that the exam is going to throw at you to make sure you understand that when you're dealing with taxes, this is the value you need to use, the assessed value. So that's the first part of this equation is you take the assessed value and you multiply it by some equalization factor. So I need to explain a little bit more. The assessed value comes from this thing where a bulk appraisal. So what happens is your taxing district may look at this housing addition and these 50 houses and go, they are all a three bedroom, two bath, 1500 square feet. And therefore we are going to assess them all at $190,000. Across the board, that's where the assessed value may come in. But there may be one house in there that is different. <clears throat> Maybe it's a little bigger than all the other houses. So they will apply this equalization factor to make sure that it achieves uniformity with all the others. Once again, that equalization factor is something you cannot determine. I am a level one tax assessor for the state of Indiana. I can do this, you can't. So the good news is the test will say something like using an equalization factor of 0.8. If they don't mention the equalization factor, it's assumed to be one because that means they're all equal, right? And any number multiplied by one is that number. So if they don't mention in the, the exam, don't panic and go, oh my God, I can't do it because no, it just means that it's one, that it's equal, all right? The third portion is where the issue is going to come in. Because you then multiply the assessed value times the equalization factor times the tax rate. And the tax rate is expressed as a mill. And a mill 
means one one thousandth of a dollar. Zero point zero zero one. Just like we expressed a point as being one percent. Remember the loan origination fee is one percent. Well, that it would be one one hundredth of a dollar. Point zero one. A mill is one one thousandth of a dollar. So a mill is going to be point zero zero one. That didn't work worth a darn. That mill is zero zero one. All right. So then that should tell you that 10 mils, as an example, is 0 0.010. There's the 10. But notice what 0 0.01 looks like. What is that? That is 1%. So 10 mils is 1%. 1 mil is a thousandth of a dollar. 10 mils is 1%. So let's do a math example. 